this is uh, you know very physiology based um, uh, lecture, and uh, so it, it, it hopefully um, won't lose your attention and cause you to go to sleep. Chini, feel free to add commentary throughout. Um, you're our invited guest lecturer. Um, you know, the, the, the title of the talk is Hypoxemic Respiratory Failure and Altered Mental Status. Um, and that is just because I inherited this talk from uh, Dr. So nearly a decade ago now. And I would never change anything that Dr. So intended. But I actually don't know that um, altered mental status and hypoxemia really should be talked together just because of the one hour time limit here. So this is virtually the only slide that talks about hypox um, altered mental status. Um, sure, hypoxia, a consequence of hypoxemia can cause altered mental status, but here is a differential uh, for hypoxemia, uh, for altered mental status that, it, um, uh, ex including other things beyond just hypoxia. Um, and I'm just going to, because it's 2020, just add COVID-19 to the list because you just have to add COVID-19 to the list. Um, but, you know, things that often get missed are things like hypoglycemia, occult liver disease, um, infection, especially in the elderly, can present without um, leukocytosis or uh, temperature dysregulation and can just primarily be initially um, altered mental status and encephalopathy. Um, End of third year psychosis is pretty common as evidenced by uh, Dr. Cheney, still thinking he's a third year, not really knowing where he is. But um, all of these things are potential causes, but really I, I'm not really gonna talk about altered mental status anymore and just talk about hypoxemic respiratory failure. Um, this, I, I'm not really very well versed in uh, the English language, so I'm not really the person to teach you uh, semantics, but uh, uh, in terms of just a technical thing about what hypoxemia versus hypoxia means, when you're talking about a low oxygen saturation or a low oxygen tension measured either um, directly from the blood or via pulse ox, then you're talking about the measurement of a low blood in uh, low blood oxygen. So that's hypoxemia. Um, hypoxia is more of a state or a condition. So if you have um, kidneys that are failing or stroke-like symptoms or uh, infarction-like symptoms of the heart, that's, the, that's hi, um, hypoxia. That's the con, uh, condition of tissue experiencing hypoxemia. Um, so most times, that the, even though these terms are kind of interchanged, most times people are referring to hypoxemia because they're talking about a low saturation or a low oxygen tension. Again, this is going to be fairly mathy, but I'm going to move through it quickly, which is going to put some of you to sleep, but hopefully, again, you'll have a chance to go through the recording. Um, but the inspired oxygen tension that we all breathe in is based on Dalton's law, which is the partial pressure of whatever gas you're talking about times the total pressure of gases in the environment. In this case, it's atmospheric pressure. Um, so that the total pressure of nitrogen, um, oxygen, and the other uh, minor gases all should equal seven when we're just talking about oxygen, you take 21% times atmospheric pressure, which we'll say is 760, and you'll get 160. So all of us at room air are breathing in an oxygen at a tension of 160. Now, this may seem um, like a number that's not, you guys probably think that 150 is, is what we usually talk about, what we breathe in, but that actually is the tracheal tension. So we breathe in 160, but what ends up in the trachea going on down to the um, airways uh, below is uh, a tension of 150 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the difference is because there's an additional gas that's in the trachea that's not um, uh, prevalent at all outside. Even in humid um, Washington summer day, there's a significant amount of water vapor that's in the airway much more than what's outside. And that water vapor is gonna to contribute to the total pressure of gas, um, and it, the total pressure is still gonna be 760, um, so that the total pressure of true gases is now going to be 760 minus the partial pressure of water vapor in the trachea. 
So when you take that water vapor pressure out and you multiply uh, the fraction that's oxygen times the pressure of all the remaining true gases, that's why it's 150 in the trachea. Please stop me if there's questions. But um, the, the, the resting alveolar oxygen tension is uh, typically, we say, around 100. So we breathe in very little carbon dioxide. Our tracheal FI, um, FI uh, tension is 150. And then what ends up uh, being the resting alveolar tension is 100. And that's because gas exchange occurs at the alveolar level. Oxygen comes off carbon dioxide gets onloaded. This is um, related at a ratio that is called the R, which happens to be the rate of exchange of CO2 to O2. So CO2 production by the body that gets eliminated by the lung and oxygen consumption across the, um, in the periphery, but gets onloaded across the lung. Um, come in, come in, come in, sorry. Um, the, uh, so the, the, this uh, ratio of carbon dioxide production to O2 consumption is um, at resting baseline around 0.8. Um, and this is uh, due to, in the periphery, uh, the combustion of um, fuels such as carbohydrates uh, to produce um, CO2 and water. And what's shown at the very bottom there is if we only were um, metabolizing glucose. If we only metabolize glucose, then you will have a um, R of one. You can see for every O2 that you um, burn, you produce one CO2. But we actually, um, at baseline, have the time and capability to burn more complex carbohydrates and fatty acids. So this ratio is much lower than one um, uh, approaching 0.6 if we had time to just burn complex fatty acids. Um, but uh, on average, our R is 0.8. That's the, um, what, uh, that, and that, that then becomes what the lung exchanges, the CO2 produced in the periphery and uh, exchanges it with oxygen that's required for further combustion. So if you take the 150 that gets delivered to the alveolus and you subtract away the alveolar CO2 over this ratio, this would give you how much oxygen um, leaves the alveolar surface and therefore you would have the, the resting alveolar tension um, thereafter. Um, notice that this is alveolar CO2. Um, so we approximate this with arterial CO2 because CO2 exchanges so quickly and efficiently that the tension is um, equivalent, alveolar and arterial. So this, of course, is the alveolar gas equation. This is something that you should know. It'll probably be given to you, but you will you'll use it during your board exam uh, because it's always on all shelf exams to calculate the so-called AA gradient when you compare this with the arterial oxygen. Got stuck. Oh, there we go. So roughly speaking, we breathe in tracheal concentration of 150. It ends up being 100 and it's resting alveolar tension after gas exchange. Um, and that helps with um, onloading oxygen onto the capillaries that go back to the arterial side of the system for further delivery of oxygen. This is a familiar slide. So again, if it's 160 out in the air, it's 150 in the trachea, 100 in the alveoli. And then there's small drop-offs due to diffusion limitation, small amount of shunt that doesn't, uh, shunted blood that doesn't necessarily go across the alveoli. Um, but the alveolar to arterial tension should be a pretty narrow gradient. Uh, classically, we say um, less than 10, but there are some age-corrected equations I'll show you as well. And then by the time that you get to the venous side, after tissue consumption of oxygen, the re um, resulting venous um, oxygen tension is on the order of 40 to 45. So this is the key equations that we've summarized so far. The alveolar gas equation that you've all seen over and over again, um, this is replaced with arterial CO2 um, approximation. You guys understand a little bit more about what R is and a normal AA gradient, uh, roughly speaking, is less than 10, 
but you can, as you get older, um, have a higher AA gradient. Um, what's really important, though, is not necessarily the oxygen tension, but the consequent saturation of hemoglobin. Yeah. Yep. Hemoglobin saturation either, but, uh, is dependent yeah. on tension. I didn't know either. But um, the, um, and, and roughly speaking, when we're in the arterial side, we're nearly 100% saturated. I think they are. They're going to You can to be on the venous um, side at tensions of what you'll have saturation about 75%. That's our venous saturation is around 75%. Uh, uh, back to the right side of the heart. Oh, uh, but just, I think... So yeah, things that cause hypoxemia include a um, um, shunt, BQ imbalance, low inspired O2, I mean, I and yeah, so then the once we figure out by far in the inpatient setting, shunt and okay, BQ sure imbalance are the predominant that. causes of hypoxemia. But they're not separate entities, and you can think about all of these as on a spectrum. Shown here schematically is what shunt is. Blood that is going past an alveolus that is not participating in gas exchange and shunting past that alveolus. Here, there's low ventilation um, relative to the perfusion across its alveolus. So this would be an example of low VQ. Most of you should be at a normal VQ. Um, uh, and then the um, uh, people that have, and then there's also um, VQ imbalance that uh, is on the high VQ oh, side. Sure. And the prototypical example is pulmonary embolism. You can see here that there's adequate ventilation, but lower perfusion here. So the VQ balance here, therefore, would be on the uh, above one or higher side. So, and the way that uh, Wes describes this, and I'll show you this on the next slide, is that. Uh, uh, that this, you know, so this, again, this is low, this uh, shunt is zero VQ, um, asthma COPD is low VQ, we're all fairly close to unity in our VQ, and uh, pulmonary embolism is an example of uh, the overall lung having high VQ. Um, and this is exactly how, how West, um, in his um, classic physiology uh, uh, manuscript, uh, talks about shunt being the far left-hand example of um, VQ imbalance. Um, so shunt and VQ are on a spectrum, uh, but shunt is unique in one specific way, which we're gonna get into here. Um, you can come in with a severe asthma exacerbation or severe shunt in the emergency room, patients are hypoxemic saturations may be in the 75% range, but there is a very characteristic uh, appearance to how, um, what shunt does um, compared to BQ at the bedside that is um, uh, easily identifiable. Anyone know what that is? Anyone want to venture in the chat world? What, what is it that makes shunt different than uh, other causes of, all other causes of hypoxemia? It doesn't respond to supplemental oxygen. Um, that's right. It doesn't correct with oxygen. And so, you know, um, and I'm going to quickly go through this because, again, I did add some slides about COVID, but I kind of want to really explain why. Let's imagine um, someone, this is uh, someone very simple with two alveoli, two pulmonary arteries, two pulmonary capillaries, a very simple organism like Bobic, let's just say. We'll just call this organism Bobic. Um, what is the resting oxygen tension um, in this shunted alveolus? It's, uh, you know, some people often answer zero. It's not quite zero. This is a fluid interface. So gas can't get across from this way, but there is fluid coming from the venous side. And here I've shown someone with a lower than usual venous tension. You, again, we said the normal venous tension was like 40, but we'll just say that uh, this person has uh, lower than that because this patient is quite ill and has a venous tension of 27. So this, you know, that's how oxygen will get across from a fluid-fluid interface, and, um, and therefore there won't be any additional contribution of oxygen to this side. Um, that 27 that comes back on the venous side will go on to this side. So if half the blood um, ends up having, this is on room air, um, having an uh, arterial saturation um, or post um, uh, lung uh, oxygen tension of 98, and half the 
tension is 27 because it shunted beyond this alveolus and didn't pick up any um, new oxygen, didn't drop off any CO2, then what would be, if half the blood were um, this and half the blood were this, what would be the tension that we would get when we did uh, um, an arterial uh, gas on Bobic? It is not the average of these two numbers, um, and this reminds us of what determines content. Remember, it is not the tension, but it is the saturation that primarily determines content. The tension will help determine how much of the hemoglobin that's going past the alveolus gets loaded with oxygen. And again, if the tension's in the high 90s in terms of millimeters of mercury, 100% of the hemoglobin uh, molecules going across the, um, the alveolus will get loaded. Then that gets delivered out to the periphery for consumption. And delivery is therefore the content times the cardiac output. So the equations are listed here. The content is 1.34, your hemoglobin, um, and your saturation. And you can see that the tension itself, while it determines the, the saturation based on this curve, um, it, it, it actually doesn't contribute in and of itself to the content by very much. This small amount that it contributes is that small amount of oxygen that gets dissolved into the blood. But most of the oxygen is bound to hemoglobin based on the properties of the hemoglobin tension saturation curve. If you put usual numbers in here, a hemoglobin close to 15 and a saturation of 100%, you will get 20 mLs per deciliter, which is the same thing as 200 mLs for every liter. That's how much oxygen there is coming out of the left ventricle. And if delivery is, uh, and so just a, another word about saturation, again, most, uh, if your tensions are in the 90 plus, you're nearly fully saturated. Again, we talked about how venous blood at uh, PO2s of 40 will be about 75% saturated. We know that 55 works out to be about 88%, 60 works out to be up 90%. And another good number to remember is that 27, 27 works out to be about 50% saturated. So going back to this case, if half of the blood um, that's coming by here sees ten uh, has tension of 27, that means it's 50% saturated, while this blood is 100% saturated. So in the periphery, this patient would have a saturation of 75%. Once these equal volumes of hemoglobin get mixed, 100% saturated hemoglobin and 50% saturated hemoglobin would end up being 75% saturated, which means the arterial saturation would be low, 40, um, because that's what works out to be 75% saturated. And this wouldn't change. Even if you gave 100% oxygen, you could get the alveolar tension on this side up to 600 plus. But because again, this isn't the delivery mode of oxygen to here, it's, it's not really going to change the arterial tension on this side. So you still will end up with a net saturation of 75% and an arterial tension of 40. And this is the problem with shunt. It doesn't respond to oxygen. Again, the key thing is that content is, de is primarily determined by saturation. But now half the blood is seeing a slight, um, a slightly, it will get a slightly higher content because we've pushed the arterial tension on this side to 600. So you may see the saturation bump up a little bit because we're driving more blood, uh, more oxygen to be dissolved in the blood. Contrast this with someone that has an asthma exacerbation. Uh, for the sake of um, symmetry, I'm making the alveolar tension here 27. Even though the um, tracheal tension is 150, let's just say that only um, that the resting tension that gets down here ends up being 27. If you give this patient just a little bit of supplemental oxygen and you double the driving pressure here, 
you might be able to double the alveolar tension here, and you'd get this alveolus up to a, um, a high oxygen tension. Um, assuming a narrow AA gradient, you can see that just a modest increase of oxygen, taking this from 27 to 50, will significantly improve how well the hemoglobin gets saturated here. And this person will have a acceptable saturation. So again, the key thing, all of that was kind of a diversion. The key thing that you um, all learned in medical school is that shunt doesn't correct with oxygen. We just went through why, um, and it helped us remember a couple of key things, that um, content is primarily determined by uh, hemoglobin saturation and that delivery is cardiac output. This is a symbol for cardiac output times um, delivery. Um, so I'm gonna skip this. You know, the, you, you extract about 25%. We talked about how consumption was about 250 mLs per minute. So the returning sat mixed venous saturation is 75%, which is why venous blood has a tension of 40 that we mentioned before. So this was a quick mathematical review of hypoxemia. Um, the alveolar tension is the primary thing that determines arterial saturation and is determined by this equation. We can modify the FiO2 and raise alveolar tension and arterial tension, assume, assuming that there's not um, significant shunt. Um, and arterial saturation is the primary thing that determines hemoglobin saturation which is much more important than tension in and of itself in uh, calculating the arterial content of oxygen. And then if you take the cardiac output times that arterial content, you have delivery, and then you have consumption in the periphery that leads to a lower returning mixed venous saturation and content. All right, and that's just shown here schematically. So, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we can apply these equations to treating patients with severe hypoxemia. Here is a classic example of some person, I won't say old because that's not so old, um, uh, with uh, ARDS from aspiration. You can see right-sided infiltrate. It looks pretty diffuse. It's not as diffuse when on CT scans. There's type, and this is what we call diffuse alveolar damage associated with ARDS, type 2 cell hyperplasia, hyaline membranes, and a mild interstitial inflammation, so-called diffuse alveolar damage, the histologic pattern we attribute most often to um, uh, ARDS. So the first thing, that, again, that we do when someone comes in hypoxemic in the uh, emergency room is give supplemental oxygen. Um, and I know that there are these formulas for every liter, you can increase the FiO2 by three or 4%. In truth, every liter of flow that comes out of the wall is 100% oxygen. Um, so you actually are giving 100% oxygen all the time. The issue is how much ambient air gets admixed with it. And so the lower the flow rate, the greater likelihood that ambient air flow, ambient air coming in with your nasal uh, inhalation will um, keep the oxygen FiO2 less than 100%. So if, you, but if you took um, somebody, um, normal healthy person and gave them four or six liters per minute via the nasal cannula and you had them close their mouths so they didn't bring in oxygen through their mouth and you even had them maybe pinch their nose and they just took nice um, long drags of nasal cannula oxygen from the hospital wall, you could get their tracheal FiO2 up to 80%. Again, because every liter has 100%. So if you're getting most of the oxygen from that supplemental oxygen and not admixing a lot of air, then you can get tracheal FiO2 up pretty high. The problem is most people that come in with hypoxemic respiratory failure have significant respiratory distress and they are nasal flaring, they're breathing through their mouth. Um, if you're like Cheney and just a natural mouth breather to begin with, then you're never gonna get uh, your tracheal FiO2 up, especially if you're in respiratory distress. 
Um, so um, I think, I, I don't know if I really included um, um, high flow nasal cannula. I'll just say a couple words about it because it's so pertinent now in this COVID era. But because the flow rates coming from the nasal cannula, these are reinforced tubes with slightly bigger prongs, and the flow rates now are on the order of 40 liters per minute to 60 liters per minute, you can really drive up tracheal FiO2 even in patients that have um, significant respiratory distress. Furthermore, that flow rate creates a little bit of um, PEEP, which will help keep airways and alveoli open. And that's the next step, right? If someone fails nasal cannula because they have significant shunt, as we said, shunt doesn't respond to that oxygen because it won't change the issue with how oxygen is unloaded or not unloaded on this side. But the idea is that if we give PEEP, that we can open up airways, we can pop open these alveoli because a flooded alveolus actually is a collapsed alveolus because you have unopposed surface tension forces that causes the alveolus to collapse. So if you apply pressure and open up the alveolus, then you could potentially improve the shunt fraction. So that's the next thing we often do when they fail nasal cannula in the emergency room, Usually in the field or in the emergency room, they get intubated there or they get put on non-invasive ventilation and get intubated shortly thereafter in an ICU. And so one way of uh, getting people between um, high flow systems and to the vent is to use non-invasive ventilation. BiPAP is one company that makes non-invasive ventilation. That's become colloquially what we call all non-invasive ventilation. But just so you know and hear it once, although I'll probably repeat it a couple times in the ICU, BiPAP is actually a trade name, not a actual device. This is what you see on PubMed um, lit searches about non-invasive ventilation. This is the term that's most commonly used. And there are other ways of giving non-invasive ventilation um, the group out of Chicago and JAMA a couple years ago published about full face masks that didn't have that uh, tight fitting mouthpiece or nose piece that typical non invasive vent um, uh, machines have. And this is a mode of ven uh, ventilation that uh, the group so showed very successfully could be used um, for patients with ARDS. Um, during this COVID era, you guys may have heard that this was a, this helmet type of mask ventilation um, is something that was used in many places in Europe. Um, this is not something that necessarily is FDA approved here, um, but uh, there are some, some uh, centers that are looking at this and had this and used this for COVID in the U.S. So if you um, can't affect um, the deliver the content and delivery, then you can work on decreasing how much oxygen gets consumed. Um, and a common way that we decrease oxygen consumption is by sedating and paralyzing. Now, all of you are only using a very small amount of your total oxygen consumption towards respiratory muscles. You guys, all you do is contract your diaphragm and let it passively um, relax. And that means that you're probably using five to 10 mLs of oxygen per minute out of that 250 mLs of oxygen that you consume for other things involving kidney, brain, and other functions. But when someone's in respiratory failure, they start to use significant accessory muscles um, and uh, actively recruit their dia diaphragm during inspiration and expiration. And their total oxygen consumption respiratory apparatus may occupy a third of that um, total consumption. And so by sedating and paralyzing someone um, when they're intubated and uh, the ventilator is fully doing the work for them, um, will decrease this amount of oxygen consumption. In addition, because they're not thrashing and flailing their legs and other things, um, maybe up to even more um, bang for your buck in terms of decreasing oxygen consumption. Just the act of intubation alone and putting on someone on the ventilator without sedating them most often increases oxygen consumption because people do not like to be on a ventilator for the most part and they react to it. Another thing that we can do is work on increasing delivery. Um, if you remember the equation for delivery, we'll go back all the way here. 
um, is cardiac output times content. So you could increase hemoglobin and you can increase cardiac output um, and that would increase content. Um, so uh, again, uh, you can increase hemoglobin, but uh, again, you don't want to necessarily maximize it. The more blood transfusions you give, the more edema you might develop in the lung, and that would therefore increase the amount of shunt that you have. So we oftentimes will violate the rule of transfusing to a hemoglobin of 7 and take the hemoglobin all the way up to 10 in patients with refractory hypoxemia. Um, and then we'll also consider giving milrinone and dobutamine to increase the cardiac output so that you can increase delivery and for the same consumption, that means that the returning mixed venous saturation would be increased. And then once on the ventilator, there's a num number of other adjunctive therapies um, that uh, we can get into, including uh, full paralysis we've kind of discussed about um, other modes of ventilation that um, kind of help keep the lung open, proning patients, or just taking the lungs out of the equation and oxygenating blood across a membrane. Um, but another therapy that we do here, since we don't do ECMO here, are inhaled therapies such as epoprostenol and inhaled nitric oxide. So again, the issue is that this side is not participating in oxygen onloading. Um, and therefore, um, assuming that there's equal blood flow on either side, this is um, an example of a 50% shunt. But inhaled therapies that selectively vasodilate the lung are going to work uh, you know, more optimally across the normal lung units. Therefore, you would get more vasodilation if given inhaled and not systemic, but inhaled, then you would improve the amount of flow going to good lung therefore decreasing the overall shunt fraction. You could go from a 50% shunt fraction to something like a 20% shunt fraction with inhaled therapies. And we use either epoprosinol, aka Flolan, or inhaled nitric oxide. This is pretty expensive, so we use inhaled epoprosinol. All right, I'm gonna, that, we actually got through quite a bit, um, and I probably did it way too quick, um, but, uh, uh, I wanted to kind of discuss a little bit about hypoxemia uh, with uh, COVID. Um, but uh, I'm going to see if you guys have any questions. Either unmute yourself, I think we're a smallish group, um, or uh, via chat. Any questions about what we've discussed uh, up till now? Key things are shunt does not improve with oxygen, that it's more than um, just increasing FiO2 if you have shunt and the other parts of the oxygen carrying uh, capacity and delivery are shown on your screen right now. And we can do things like increasing the hemoglobin, but we don't want to necessarily cause the lung to get more edematous, so we just optimize it and sometimes take it up to 10. We will um, increase cardiac output so that we can increase delivery. And we do things to decrease consumption, like taking care of fevers or sedating someone. Um, uh, or even paralyzing them. But this is how we typically deal with um, hypoxemic respiratory failure. This is kind of like the um, way high overview of management of hypoxemic respiratory failure. If there are no questions, um, we'll talk a little bit for 15 minutes about um, what we saw with, what we're seeing with uh, SARS-CoV-2. I don't want to be presumptuous and assume that the worst is behind us since it seems like other places are having quite a relapse. Okay, so let's go on. So there is an interesting um, difference with how the ARDS, so the so-called ARDS of um, COVID-19 um, presented itself. It, it, it arguably isn't ARDS. Um, it seems like uh, that it's, uh, it's very different. Um, and doesn't respond to some of the standard therapies that, um, that we typically go through for ARDS. Um, you guys um, are familiar with the SARS-CoV virus. These, this large spike protein is thought to be the thing that it, um, will attach to the ACE receptors on alveolar epithelium. But it seems very clear 
that it's more than the epithelium of the alveoli that are involved, that there's vascular damage, that there, the virus attacks the pulmonary endothelium, and maybe even platelets directly. And some of this um, is uh, borne out in some of the autopsy series that I'll show you coming up. But I wanted to uh, just go through the history of the last few months. We heard these reports of the majority of patients in Wuhan dying if they ended up on mechanical ventilation. And even when things um, uh, spread through Europe and started to hit the Northwest US and New York City, um, mortality seemed to be variable, but uh, very high. And there were reasons why, for instance, in this JAMA publication from Lombardy, Italy, that the mortality was fairly low. One of the reasons is that most of the patients, 58% of the patients were still technically in the ICU when this was published. Um, therefore, their outcome had not been determined. And this is a gross underestimate of what their actual mortality probably would have been. And similarly, this is uh, probably so too high of a number um, as it also didn't account for final outcomes. In truth, um, accurately predicting the mortality from COVID-19 uh, is conflicted in many ways. Uh, one thing as mentioned is how to account for all the patients in the denominator. What, were, are they still in the hospital? Are they still in the ICU? Or are you only reporting numbers on people that have gotten through the ICU or through the hospital? So that confounds uh, reported mortality rates. Furthermore, physical and uh, local limitations such as resource availability about the number of ventilators in China certainly led to um, the sickest of people getting ventilators and high mortality probably. Likewise, there was um, severe rationing, if you'll remember, uh, in March um, in uh, New York City hospitals uh, where mortality um, was, was reportedly quite high. Um, if you look at um, rough mortality in COVID is probably somewhere between 25 and 50 percent. And we fall kind of smack in the middle of that, just as an FYI, but uh, and, and again, how you count it, how you use resources, what resources you have, and rationing of resources all kind of affect mortality numbers that you'll see from everywhere. A couple of interesting things that were found on autopsy series, and there's a number of these studies now. I'm trying to show you the two biggest ones. This first came out after the horrible New Orleans Mardi Gras experience, um, outlining the uh, autopsy findings in 10 black patients from New Orleans um, after their little outbreak. Um, and what was really interesting in the lung is that many of them had the diffuse alveolar damage that we associate with ARDS, um, but there was a lot more thrombosis and uh, small vessel damage. Um, that, uh, and, and this is the study that kind of suggested that the uh, platelets and their precursors had an abundance of the virus within them, suggesting that maybe that might contribute to this hypercoagulable state, um, at, at least in part. Um, also kind of notable is the absence of secondary infections. Most patients that die of ARDS from influenza or aspiration, um, they, after languishing in the ICU for a while, they usually pick up some form of nosocomial infection. Um, and that wasn't seen in any of these 10 patients, and it might have just been a sampling size issue. But even more interesting in the New England Journal last month, uh, a comparative look at autopsy findings from seven COVID-19 patients with seven recent influenza deaths um, were compared. Um, many of the same findings, diffuse alveolar damage, lack of infections, thrombus, as the New Orleans series are reported again, but now because you're comparing uh, COVID patients with influenza, you can see that the thrombi were nine times more prevalent in different areas of the lung in COVID patients than they are in um, influenza. Similar, uh, and also very um, novelly, the, there is this, uh, un, under electron microscopy shown on the right there, this weird kind of pattern of blood vessel damage called intersusceptive angiogenesis, um, meaning that the virus was probably involving the endothelium of the lung and causing this novel type of inflammation um, that uh, a primary inflammation of the blood vessel wall itself called intersusceptive angiogenesis.
I put these in here not to be able to describe that to you, but um, just to leave you with a pretty picture. This um, idea that thrombosis occurs in patients with COVID that we all now, um, after struggling with a little bit up front, are familiar with are things that we saw here. Um, I'll show you some images of patients with, this is a, um, a apical four chamber right atrium, right ventricle, uh, played again, and you guys can see thrombus, which is what we call clot in transit, going through um, the right side of the heart. Similarly, another patient, same finding, clot in transit, apical four chamber right side here, and you can see organizing clot that's trying to get through out into the lungs to look like this, right? So this is massive pulmonary embolism, and we, this is a case of somebody with COVID pneumonia here that had massive pulmonary embolism. It seems both here and around the country, what was more reported was small vessel thrombus, as, as also shown in those autopsy series, that more of the small vessels were involved. Um, notably compared with other um, causes of venal thromboembolism, while we did find DBTs, um, it wasn't at quite the high rate as other series of PEs. Um, suggesting that maybe COVID-19 caused in situ thrombosis in some of these small vessels, whether related to platelet dysfunction, endothelial damage, or endothelial injury, or this um, weird type of intussusceptive angiogenesis, um, there seems to be, um, or other parts of the uh, coagulation profile gone awry, um, there seem to be a good bit of small vessel thrombosis, um, estimated to be on the order of 20 to 30 percent. Um, I'm just showing you some pretty pictures here so you don't fall asleep, but this is um, leg Dopplers. This is uh, the uh, femoral. This is going to be on the right side. This is the uh, superficial femoral, the profundus femoral artery. These are the arteries, and immediately you'll see the um, femoral vein. Um, and what's notable is when you compress this area, this should collapse, and I'll show you an image of that coming up, but notice how this vessel here where the blue arrow is, does not compress. You can even make out some echogenic material there at the very end of this, that kind of grayscale here. Same person, a little bit higher up in the leg here, and you can see the thrombus a little bit more clearly. Here you just have the common femoral artery. There's the vein, and again, the artery compresses more than the vein does. The artery shouldn't compress at all, and if you're putting that much pressure on it, the vein should be fully collapsed. Same patient, opposite side leg, shown here, and you can see what normal compression ultrasonography should look like. The vein is medial and on the left-hand side here, and you can see that the artery doesn't compress at all, and the vein becomes slit-like very quickly on minimal compression. It doesn't even deform the artery, the amount of compression in the vein is uh, compressed. So we saw a lot of clot, long story short. Um, and a clot seems to be a prevailing thought, um, a, a very common uh, occurrence in patients with uh, COVID-19. And maybe even more of them had um, less easy to identify microvascular disease, this weird type of new inflammation, or maybe even smaller microvascular thrombi that you would only pick up on autopsy. So again, going back to how we treat patients with severe hypoxemia, it's really, uh, we think that a lot of people with severe hypoxemia not responsive to oxygen will have shunt. So we apply positive pressure. This positive pressure will open up airway collapse. It should help open up alveolar collapse um, that's related to shunt. And this is, in, in our mind, what we think would happen by application of pressure. The issue with COVID patients, um, as I've already outlined, they may have uh, vascular disease that's either grossly visible or not visible, unless you have special electron microscopy ability. Um, but it also, um, the pattern of the lung injury is haphazard and um, not homogeneous. Shown here, a patient of ours, an early patient of ours, that initially admitted with a little bit of focal pneumonia, by the time that they got to the ICU, had developed, but still isn't diffuse. It's just more consolidated in a couple of different locations, maybe in there, um, but so not a diffuse disease. Um, I'm gonna skip this for the 
but I'll tell you, we can measure uh, what, what I'm going to tell you uh, using the ventilator. I'm going to take a moment and just plug the ventilective, which hopefully will um, happen again. We did only once last uh, year, but we will do it um, at least once this year, if not twice this year, in the fall and in the spring. And we'll talk about uh, uh, measuring some of the things that we're going to talk about. And this is what was happening probably in these patients and probably why there was a high mortality reported um, as the disease spread from Asia across Europe. If you do have um, shunt in some focal non-diffuse areas and haphazardly have vascular pathology, be it um, intraluminal inflammation or thrombus, then applying positive pressure may actually, you know, not necessarily go to the areas that you want to improve um, the alveolar shunt appearance, but may actually over distend good alveolus. You could see how this could confound VQ balancing even more by causing compression of already damaged or um, clotted vasculature, leading to greater drops in preload um, to the left atrium and left ventricle, and also worsening VQ balance that would, change, would worsen gas exchange. Said another way, and we again measured this by seeing how PEEP uh, would uh, worsen both hemodynamics and gas exchange and compliance um, on the ventilator, uh, we realized that protocols of using high PEEP, high pressures, such as the oscillator and APRV, those are ways of just giving really high amounts of PEEP. Even our conventional ways of giving PEEP may cause damage, again, because of the effect that PEEP may have and not the one that we would want PEEP to have, which is this type of uh, improvement. Um, so we ended up using um, a lot of high flow nasal cannula and trying to avoid intubation. Once they did get intubated, um, because of hypo how hypoxemic they were, to decrease oxygen consumption, we would deeply sedate them, um, leading to lots of long-term complications. Uh, many of them got paralyzed for long periods of time. We proned people outside the scope of this talk and the time we have, but really good uh, um, evidence, again, in ARDS, which this, this disease may not be, but that ARDS and severe hypoxemia has benefited from proning came out of a PROVISA study published in the New England Journal in 2016. We sent a few people over to the hospital center for ECMO, and we used a lot of uh, inhaled therapies, um, that Flolan in particular. So um, we don't know whether the proning in the uh, EPO benefited these patients. We definitely know that using high amounts of PEEP and using uh, modalities that potentially um, really cause over distension due to the haphazard uh, location of the, um, uh, the epithelial process and maybe concomitant um, vascular pathology, PEEP may not work and may have contributed to the high mortality seen um, in uh, early experiences with COVID elsewhere. Um, I guess that's it. That's uh, where I'll, I'll end. So that's how we kind of amended our usual um, ARGENET and hypoxemia protocol um, within the COVID epidemic. And then we went through a lot uh, that we have about five minutes if uh, there are questions about hypoxemic respiratory failure or COVID management um, with hypoxemia in the ICU. So I'll just go back and leave a summary slide in general about hypoxemia. The things that we focus on are um, improving um, alveolar tension, optimizing um, al um, uh, oxygenation, but oftentimes improving alveolar tension by increasing FiO2 doesn't lead to this because of shunt. And then we have to focus on how we can improve um, content or content by either optimizing hemoglobin or improve delivery by increasing um, cardiac output. And at the same time, decreasing um, consumption, sedation, treating fevers.